Hi there, my highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premium virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute, with a difference where patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very, very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some very useful tips which may prove very very handy in your line of duty so i welcome you to part 98 of our pharmacotherapy mcq series which measures in infectious diseases welcome so the first question reads which of the following would result if in your institution antibiotic therapy was prolonged unnecessarily would it be A, decreased clinical failure rates? Would it be B, decreased rates of clostridioides difficile infections, which we abbreviate as DCIs? Or C, would it be increased antimicrobial costs? Or would it be D, decreased rates of adverse events? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. C would be the correct answer. It would lead to increased antimicrobial costs. I would like to start off by saying that recommending a duration of therapy based on uh, patient-specific factors is important, is actually an important component of antimicrobial stewardship programs, which we abbreviate as ASPs, according to the IDSA AMS guidelines. Now, I would like to emphasize that unnecessarily prolonged durations of therapy results in higher antimicrobial costs and places more patients at a risk of adverse effects and even clostridioides difficile infection. Several studies have found similar success rates with shorter durations of therapy compared to unnecessarily prolonged therapy. So don't go there. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, below are listed common risk factors for endocarditis. So my question to you is, which one of them poses the highest risk to patients? Is it IV drug use or abuse? Or is it chronic IV access? Or is it prosthetic heart valve? Or is it chronic heart failure? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Prosthetic heart valve it is. I would like to comment that prosthetic heart valve and previous endocarditis carry the highest risk for a fresh or a new case of endocarditis. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mrs. TMC, a 49-year-old female patient, is admitted to your general medical ward with community acquired pneumonia abbreviated as CAP. The clinical team observes a right middle lobe infiltrate and uh, TMC remains a febrile but has a productive cough. She has a past medical history of uh, mild COPD and she has no known drug or food allergies. So my question to you is, 
which of the empiric antibiotic regimens listed below would be the most ideal for Mrs. TMC now now? Would you choose to treat her with ciprofloxacin co-administered with clindamycin or would you opt to use deptomycin and clarithromycin or would you opt to use cefotaxim and azithromycin or would you use piperacinin tazobactam alone infused at a dose of 4.5 grams over 4 hours every 6 hours I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So the most ideal regimen for her would be cefotaxim and azithromycin. I'd like to start by saying that empiric therapy for adults with community-acquired pneumonia who are admitted to the general medical ward should include coverage for streptococcus pneumoniae and atypical microorganisms which may include chlamydia pneumoniae, legionella pneumophila and mycoplasma pneumoniae. The only option that offers uh, coverage for both for this indication, in my opinion, would be a beta lactam alongside a macrolide antibiotic. Uh, respiratory fluoroquinolones would also be acceptable, although it uh, may have more side effects than uh, a beta lactam co administered with a macrolide. I'd just like to emphasize that mycoplasma is an intracellular organism without a cell wall and thus will not show up in a gram stain. You will not be able to stain them under your microscope. So after those many words, I tend to be biased towards alternative C, cefotaxim and azithromycin. Let's move to the next question. This And it reads, Mrs. TKD, a 20-year-old female college student, presents to your infectious disease clinic with symptoms of an uncomplicated urinary tract infection. She has no significant past medical history and no known drug food allergies. Currently, she uses Yasmin for birth control, for contraception. Your consultant prescribes nitrofurantoin for this lady, TKD. So my question to you is, what duration of therapy would you recommend as the infectious diseases clinical pharmacist specialist in that team? Would you recommend one week, three days, five days, or a single start dose? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would recommend five days of therapy. Uh, treatment duration of five days of nitrofurantoin therapy has been shown to be equivalent to three days of cotrimoxazole. I'd just like to digress a bit and add that phosphomycin, marketed as monural, can be used as a single dose. So answer D applies to phosphomycin, not to nitrofurantoin. But it appears to have an inferior efficacy when compared with the standard short course regimens uh, of agents such as nitrofurantoin. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, JPO, a sexually active youth, presents to your HIV clinic six hours after having unprotected sexual intercourse. My question to you is, which of the details listed below would you mandatorily document before prescribing PrEP uh, using 
TDF co-formulated with the m or TAF co-formulated with m For this gentleman, JPO, who appears worried of the risks posed by his girlfriend who insists on having unprotected sexual intercourse with him without using a condom. Would you docu insist on documenting H having documented HBV virus infection and vaccination status? Or would it be a negative TB test? Or would it be negative HIV test? Or would it be negative pregnancy test? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I would document A and C. I would doc how, insist on having documented HBV infection and vaccination status alongside negative HIV test results. I would like to emphasize that patients who inadvertently receive PrEP but have undocumented HIV infection are at a risk of developing resistance to their medication. Therefore, an uh, active HIV infection needs to be ruled out, in my opinion, before prescribing PrEP. Now, HBV infection status should be documented by screening serology before PrEP is prescribed. Those patients determined to be susceptible to HBV infection should be vaccinated. It's very, very important. I would just like to add that those patients found to be HBSAG positive, those who have a surface antigen positivity, should be evaluated for possible treatment either by the clinician providing PrEP or by linkage to an experienced HBV care provider. Now, pregnancy and breastfeeding and contraindications to PrEP. I'd just like to add that a negative test isn't required. Then TB testing isn't required to prescribe PrEP either. I'd just like to remind you that TDA, TDF or TAF and FTC are active against HBV. Now, HBV mono-infected patients taking TDF or TAF co-formulated with FTC, whether as PrEP or to treat HBV infection, who then stop these medications must have their liver function closely monitored for reactivation of HBV replication, which can result in hepatic damage. So when you are carrying out PrEP with this agents be very very careful and cautious let's move to the next question please and it reads bty a 35 year old patient with acute myelogenous leukemia abbreviated as aml is admitted to your hemato oncology ward for induction chemotherapy he currently receives acyclovir levofloxacin and posaconazole as antimicrobial prophylaxis. His chief complaint includes some gas and abdominal discomfort since finishing his chemotherapy regimen. His medical oncology diagnoses gastritis probably from his dexamethasone premedication for emesis prophylaxis. So my question to you is, which of the agents listed below should Mr. B.T.Y. avoid? Should he avoid thermotidine? Should he avoid that antacid containing aluminum hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide alongside cymethicone? Or should he avoid pentoprazole? Or should he avoid sucralfate? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer.
this fellow should avoid pentoprazole, marketed as protonix. Now, the use of proton pump inhibitors alongside posaconazole or itraconazole capsules will negatively impact absorption of the azole antifungus, and that could lead to therapeutic failure when you're using them to manage fungal infections. I'd just like to add that co-administration with esomeprazole resulted in a 30% decrease in posaconazole area under the curve. And uh, it is recommended to take posaconazole with meals and to avoid all proton pump inhibitors if possible and feasible. Now, co-administration of cimetidine, which is marked as tagamet, led to a decrease in posaconazole area under the curve of around 39. However, other H2 receptor blockers such as famotidine, nizatidine, ranitidine, or the oral antacids didn't significantly alter posaconazole concentrations. So just pay attention to those PPIs and avoid co-administering them with the azole antifungal posaconazole to be specific. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. STO, a 56-year-old male patient suffering from congestive heart failure, CHF, presents to your clinic where the chest physician diagnoses him with community-acquired pneumonia. 60 days ago, he had a sinus infection and was treated with ceftinib. He has no known drug or food allergies. And uh, his current outpatient medications include cavedilol and enalapril. So my question to you is, which of the medications listed below would be the most appropriate choice for the management of community-acquired pneumonia in the case of Mr. S. T O would it be amoxicillin, gem, gemifloxacin, azithromycin, or doxycycline? I'll give you ten seconds to choose the correct answer. Gemifloxacin would be the correct choice here. Now, the IDSA Community Acquired Pneumonia Guidelines recommend either a respiratory fluoroquinolone, which includes gemifloxacin, or levofloxacin dosed at 750 milligrams IV or orally OD, or even moxifloxacin. Yeah, those three fluoroquinolones are recommended as monotherapy. Alternatively, you can use a beta lactam plus a macrolide for outpatients with comorbid conditions or recent antimicrobial therapy. That is outlined clearly in the IDSA CAP guidelines. Now, these patients are more likely to have CAP due to drug resistant streptococcus pneumonia or gram negative bacteria. So, fluoroquinolone use has however been discouraged due to increased risk of uh, C. diff associated diarrhea. So don't use it recklessly and unnecessarily. We just like to add that fluoroquinolones should be used with caution in patients equal to or above the age of 65 due to the increased risk of tendon rupture and even tendinitis. Fluoroquinolones are unlikely to cause clinically meaningful Sorry so for that slip. I'll repeat again. Fluoroquinolones are likely to cause clinically uh, meaningful QTC prolongation even when used alone. But the risk increases when they are co-administered with other QT prolonging drugs and or QTC prolonging health conditions. So be very, very careful and use them especially in the cardiac patients or in the elderly. Let's move to the next question, please. 
and it reads, an immunocompromised patient presents to your accident and emergency department with signs and symptoms concerning for uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus cellulitis. So my question to you is, which of the medications listed below would be administered to treat his MRSA infection with the bactericidal activity to be specific? Underline the word bactericidal. Would it be vancomycin, ceftaroline, deptomycin, or doxycycline? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So vancomycin, ceftaroline, and daptomycin all meet those conditions. Now bactericidal agents should always be used in any empiric regimen in an immunocompromised patient such as this one that we're referring to since the immune systems can't provide reliable support to fight the infection. I would just like to add that uh, bacteriostatic agents require a functioning immune system to appropriately treat an infection or an infectious condition. Just like to add that beta lactams, cyclic lipopeptides, and glycopeptide antibiotics are all bactericidal in their mode of killing. Now, in most cases, antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis are bacteriostatic, just for your information. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. J and K, a 62-year-old male patient, presents to your accident and emergency department and is diagnosed with meningitis. Things are serious indeed. He has no known drug or food allergies. As an outpatient, he takes sertraline and metformin alongside hydrochlorothiazide. His past medical history includes depression, for which he takes sertraline, type 2 diabetes mellitus, which he manages using uh, metformin, and hypertension, which he manages using hydrochlorothiazide. So my question to you is, which of the therapeutic regimens listed below would be the most appropriate for Mr. J and K? Would you opt to use ceftriaxone alongside vancomycin, or would you use vancomycin and uh, ampicillin, or would you use ampicillin, ceftriaxone, and vancomycin, or would you settle for ampicillin, ceftriaxone alone? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. choose to treat J and K with ampicillin, ceftriaxone, and vancomycin. Now, the IDSA meningitis guidelines state that all the three agents, that is ampicillin, ceftriaxone, and vancomycin, should be administered to patients who are above the age of 50 years as empiric therapy. This is because this patient population is at a risk of MDR streptococcus pneumonia infection as well as listeria monocytogenes. Vancomycin has inferior cerebrospinal fluid penetration rates compared to ceftriaxone, but it is useful in patients who are at risk of meningitis due to MDR strep pneumo. Now, ampicillin and penicillin are considered drugs of choice for listeria infection, so it's very important and crucial to add ampicillin to the duo of ceftriaxone and vancomycin. Let's move to the next question, please. And reads, which of the medications listed below is administered as a start dose in the treatment of influenza? Is it ocetamivir, emantadine, 
the Ramivia or the Namivia? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Pyramivia it is. Now Pyramivia marketed as Rapivab is an IV influenza virus neuraminidase inhibitor and it is indicated for the treatment of acute and complicated influenza in patients 18 years or older who have been symptomatic for no more than two days. It is administered as a single dose. Now, alternative B, emantadine, which is marketed as Cymetro, is an oral antiviral, which is indicated for prophylaxis and treatment of signs and symptoms of infection caused by various strains of influenza A virus. It's no longer very popular because of resistance issues. It is administered orally for 10 days. Then, uh, Alternative A, or Celtamivia, which is marketed as Tamiflu, is an oral influenza virus neuraminidase inhibitor indicated for the treatment of acute and complicated influenza in patients two weeks of age and older who have been symptomatic for no more than two days or for prophylaxis of influenza in patients one year or older. Mark the age bracket one year or older it is administered for five to ten days then alternative d zanamivir which is marked as relenza disc heller is an inhaled influenza virus neuraminidase inhibitor it is indicated for the treatment of influenza in patients age seven years and above mark the age bracket seven years and above who have been symptomatic for no more than two days and can also be used prophylactically uh, in patients aged five years and above. And I would like to remind you that it is inhaled for five, 10, or even 28 days. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the antiretroviral drugs listed below used in heart highly active antiretroviral therapy for long-term management of HIV infection increases the risk of cardiovascular events, especially myocardial infarction. Is it the NRTI-based heart? Is it the NRTI-based heart? Or is it protease inhibitor based heart? Or is it true that none? There is no evidence that any heart regimens increase the risks for myocardial infarctions. MIs. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So it's actually the protease inhibitor based heart regimens that pose this risk. Now the data that uh, best supports this answer comes from uh, the data collection on adverse events of anti-HIV drugs, which we call DAD study, which has shown that the incidence of MI increased from 1.53 per 1,000 person years in those not exposed to PIs to 6.01 per 1,000 person years in those exposed to PIs for more than six years. I would just like to add that uh, even after adjustment for several risk factors such as gender, age, ethnicity, BMI, family history for CVD, smoking status, previous cardiovascular events, and even calendar year, 
the relative rate of MIs per year of uh, PI exposure was uh, 1.16 with a 95% clinical CI of uh, 1.1 to 1.23 versus relative rate per year of 1.05 with a 95% confidence inch in interval of 0 0.98 to 1.13 for the NNRTI exposure. Now, when lipids were included in the adjustment, the relative rate of MI per year of exposure to PI is reduced to 1.1 with a 90% confidence interval of 1.04 to 1.18, suggesting that they may or there, sorry, may be additional risks with PI use over traditional cardiovascular risk factors. So be careful when choosing them as part of HIV regimens for your patients, especially those with cardiovascular risk. I would just like to add that the DAD study is also consistent with other analyses that have shown that the duration of PI use was associated with higher risks of MI with a relative hazard of 2.56 with a 95% confidence interval of 1.03 to 6.34. Now this is in part due to the changes in the lipid profile induced by the PIs. Now while PIs, the protease inhibitors, can clearly cause this dyslipidemia, this doesn't explain all other risks associated with MI. Just for your information. Let's move to the next question. And the next question reads, you are part of a clinical team rounding on a 66-year-old female patient with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who is currently admitted in your medical ICU for sepsis due to a urinary tract infection. She is receiving appropriate IV antibiotics alongside vasopressors. Her average MAP over the past six hours has been 71 mm of mercury. Now, over the past four hours, her blood glucose readings have been 120, 190, 220, and 240 milligrams per deciliter. So my question to you is when should your clinical team initiate the hospital protocol for blood glucose management? Is the correct answer if the next reading is above 220? Should it be after 190 milligrams per deciliter reading? Should it be after the 220? milligrams per deciliter reading or should it be after the 240 milligrams per deciliter reading? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. should be after the 220 milligrams per deciliter reading. Now the surviving sepsis and septic shock guidelines recommend a protocolized approach to blood glucose management in ICU patients with sepsis, commencing insulin dosing when two consecutive blood glucose levels are above 180 milligrams per deciliter. Now, the accuracy of glucose measurements by the arterial blood gas analyzers and glucose meters have been found to be significantly higher than glucose meters using capillary blood. Therefore, the guidelines recommend using arterial blood rather than capillary blood for the point of care testing using glucose meters if patients have arterial catheters. That's just for your information. Let's move to the next question, please.
And the next question reads, which of the antibiotics listed below binds to components of the cell membrane of bacteria causing rapid depolarization and inhibition of DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis? Is it ceftaroline for some ill, thambutol, deptomycin, or is it tedizolate? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Deptomycin it is. Now, deptomycin marketed as cubicin is a cyclic lipopeptide antibiotic that has a unique mechanism of action. That is, it binds to components of cell membranes of bacteria, thereby causing rapid depolarization and inhibition of DNA, RNA, and even protein synthesis. Uh, Dizolid answer D, marketed as cyvextro and linezolid, marketed as Zyvox, are oxazolidinone antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis by blocking the action of the 50S ribosome. Ethambutol, which is alternative B, is an antitubercular agent for the treatment of tuberculosis. Uh, and it an inhibits rabinozyl transferase that is involved in mycobacterial cell wall synthesis. It is known to increase uric acid levels that can cause gout attack. So it's not the right answer to this question. And then ceftaroline fosamide, marketed as teflaro, is a fifth generation cephalosporin that inhibits cell wall synthesis by blocking transpeptidase or penicillin binding protein. Now, its activity against MRSA is useful in therapy. It's the only cephalosporin, one of the two cephalosporins with activity against MRSA. Now, just like to add that deptomycin has MRSA coverage and is uniquely indicated for right-sided endocarditis when the infection is caused by MRSA, now, its unique mechanism prevents it from being used in the treatment of pneumonia due to its B, the ability to bind to phospholipids within surfactant, which renders it less active or ineffective. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the toxicities listed below is a boxed warning discouraging the use of ketoconazole as first-line oral antifungal therapy. Is it tediv dyskinesia? Is it hepatotoxicity? Is it ketoacidosis? Or is it renal failure? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So hepatotoxicity it is. Now, ketoconazole, marketed as nizoro, is an antifungal administered orally once a day. I'd like to emphasize that serious hepatotoxicity, including cases of with fatal outcomes or requiring liver transplantation, have occurred with the use of ketoconazole. Now, some patients had no obvious risk factors for liver disease, even though hepatotoxicity occurred. So I would like to warn you that patients receiving ketoconazole should be informed by their physician of the risks and should be closely monitored in the course of therapy. So there you have it, my highly esteemed viewers and listeners. That brings us to the end of this video, part 98 of our MCQ series. If this video benefited you in any way, I would like to humbly urge you to remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers and to leave your comments at the bottom of the video. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. 
I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to me. And I sincerely appreciate your partnership, your continued support, and even your very kind collaboration. And I look forward to interacting with you in the next video. Thank you very much.